There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Okay, well, welcome to another Word in Your Attic, where we're joined by the comedian, author, broadcaster and scientist that The Guardian once described as a bicardigan polymath. And there is no greater compliment. It's the great <laughs> Robin Ince. Robin, it's wonderful to see you. How are Hello, you? All right. I think I should. I think the Cardigan polymath, though it got used by the Guardian, I think it was the great work of Sean Keaveney originally. Oh, was um, it? And, oh, I, right. and I wish to. I, I'm just going to say because I think Sean Keaveney is such a great broadcaster, and and I've done lots of interviews with him when he used to do the breakfast show, and he'd be so tired, and he'd be recording it like a pre-recording, and he'd just be lying on the floor, just with his eyes closed, just asking you questions, and it had. There was something rather kind of Prisoner of War movie about it. <laughs> oh right! Well, good to credit him. I thought there was uh, yeah, there, absolutely there was uh, there is no higher praise in the Guardian. So look, how are you, and, and, and where are you, in fact? I'm I'm in my attic, uh, which I've just tidied, so it's looking really good at the moment. This is uh, oh, it's a real oh, attic. Oh, oh this is what we want. and you've got a giant telescope behind you. I think yeah, right? I've got a giant telescope, and I've got all the things. I, I've got rid of about um, two to three thousand books during the lockdown so it's really clear now this is the neatest <laughs> you ever see it <laughs> god you got rid of three thousand books yeah i started selling books i started a little online book because i i I have to have too much to do. If I don't have too much to do, it allows me to start thinking about other things. And of course, with the lockdown, it meant that, you know, all the gigs were gone. So I started doing loads of online gigs and all that kind of thing. And then I suddenly yeah. thought, I know that I have too many books in the, you know, I, I always think of that John Peel story of the fact that he had to have the uh, the foundations of his garage uh, re-cemented uh, because it was beginning to sink due to the weight of some of the records in there. And because my room is the attic room, if this starts sinking, that's got a lot of uh, ramifications for uh, my wife and son. So I decided to start getting... I mean, some of the books went to Leicester Prison uh, because I was thinking ahead, just in case. What? You know, so, so I've, <laughs> I've, I've sent ahead just in case anything goes awry. <laughs> Dave and I have exactly the same feeling. Our records are up in the attics. We have this terrible feeling, I do anyway, that somebody would be sleeping in our spare room one night and there'd be a crack in the ceiling above them and they'd be killed by a gentle giant album <laughs> crashing <laughs> through the plaster work. What a way to go. But anyway, look, so we, we normally start this by asking people if they can remember the, the, the record-playing equipment in their home. Uh, when they were growing up, where, where did you where did you grow up? In fact, it was outside London. Was it just outside. Yeah, London? it was just it was it was very near Chorley Wood, which of course yeah. people know is where bad bread was invented. Uh, someone was uh, haranguing me for that the other day. That's where the the process of basically uh, I can't remember what it was. It was something like throwing together air and water and creating bread. So the reason that now, yeah, we're all of a generation where we can kind of say, oh, bread used to be solid, and now you can get a loaf and crush it to that size. That is uh, Chorley Wood. So so um, that and obviously John Betjeman wandering around there every now. And again in metro land that's my kind of uh, that, that's where i was from so uh and and my records would have been record house in amersham on the hill that was one place and also going to watford market on a tuesday there was a record stall there so that that was uh but the the record playing thing we have one uh like one of those proper really old uh what are they called it's not a radiogram just a little kind of a dance set kind of thing yeah oh, okay. you, like a portable one yeah Pretty much portable, but yeah. just, it had a yeah, carrying yeah. handle on the side, didn't it? So just you take too it to the big beach. to be portable, but with yeah, the yeah. hint that it was. So it would yes, suggest absolutely. it carried, <laughs> but ultimately was a disaster. But no sane yeah, yeah, person yeah. would have done. Yeah, no. I, I, yeah. 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 And what so you with, did did, did your mum and dad it? have a records? Did your mum and dad uh, have records? Were there records in the house? Well, I've got somewhere here in this. If you hold on, I, I've got my mum's only moment of rock. Uh, is uh, I've got. Uh, hang on a minute. Sorry, all of this was ordered, but I went into the garden right. today, and it all went a bit awry. But um, somewhere here, I've, there we are. This is my mum's only moment of rock and roll. This is rock around the clock. There we go. The Brunswick. Uh, right. On no, the Brunswick right. Label. Yeah. Um, Very good. There we go. In the back. This isn't quite rhythm and blues. Not quite hillbilly. Not quite Tim Pan Alley. Not quite anything for which there is a standard definition. It's a kind of shaking, rattling and rolling music that shakes a lot of people, rattles others and rolls along all the time. Whatever it is, it's happy and guaranteed party live 
and uh so that yeah that's a brilliant piece of copywriting that's really good fantastic it It is sold mambo (laughs) rocks on it see you later alligator r o c k and obviously rock around the clock and this was she never my mum was born in 1939 um was just she like her the music taste generally in the house was easy uh Big fan of things like Hooked on Classics, the disco version of Tchaikovsky, etc., from the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. Um, so in terms of my parents, there was not... Pop music was... There, there was one Carpenter's album with a kind of airbrushed photograph of a of a red sports car on it. I can't remember what that oh, was. Oh, Now and Then. Now and Then. It's called right. Now and Then. The of course, that's all. That's the, the, the most I have to give you. I don't even have to give you the model of the car. It's highly impressive. And uh, yeah, the car was Richard Carpenter's. The house was it was Karen. But anyway, carry on. Go on. Brilliant. Good work. <laughs> but yeah, that was. It's such a pity you bet's not on television anymore because you'd win every single week. <laughs> um, but it is. Uh, yeah. So that that was it. We'd, we'd have that um, hooked on classics. Those kind of. Um, uh, compilation albums of different themes, the themes and dream, which I think was really kicked off by Reflections, probably the the oh, um, right. which had Bridehead revisited on it and uh, Chariots of Fire and the theme to Cosmos by Vangelis, Heaven and Earth, and that kind of stuff. And so that that was, and then my sisters, they were again. We didn't have that many records. I don't quite know why I was such an because I be, I was a real I was a proper under the bedclothes listening to the great big radio that was just about portable that I could sneak under there, listen to radio Luxembourg or, or, or Peel or whatever from quite an early age. Um, and I, I, I'm the only, I think music obsessive in, in, in the family. Right. And so what was your first musical obsession? Well, I remember, I mean, the, the, one of the first, what the, the first proper obsession, I've got one to, I've, I've got missing words by the selector here uh, with right. uh, Carrie Go Bring Home on, on the, uh, in the nice kind of uh, tr- just plain two-tone sleeve as, as it was done. And somewhere here as well, I think I've got uh, Ghost Town, the um, uh, th- three song version that somewhere. I don't know if you need to see all these, but I've got that. No, 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 and no, these no, were the no. first singles that you bought as it were. Would, would no, you? the very first yeah. single that I bought and I was really desperate that it would not be knocked off the number one slot by uh, Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights. Cause I loved it so much was uh, Brian and Michael's match sort men and match sort cats. Oh, Earth. right. I, I love <laughs> that. Very I remember that age when you really thought, <clears throat> that your purchase was the one that was going to make all the difference. You felt involved in you in the chart. Yeah, I think I, I think it was bought in a department store in Watford, probably with my grandma. Yeah. And I remember being particularly, there was a, the B-side was uh, just one of those ones, oh, granddad's rocking chair, he had a chair, it was rocking, you know, one of those kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. And, and I loved that. And I was fascinated in the fact that one of the, I, I think it wasn't the, you'll, you'll know this, David. It wasn't the original Michael, was it? Is that right? There was, it was recorded. And then I think after it being recorded, Michael went, do you know what, Brian? Ugh, I'm out of it. And then the song got released and uh, another Michael, a bit, a bit like somebody else took the Roy. part of Michael. It's a, it's a Sam and Dave format. Extraordinary. <laughs> I wonder it who got the money. <laughs> yeah. Because it was um, a but, huge hit, wasn't it? This is number mm. one for weeks, wasn't it? It felt like, I mean, but for me, it felt like weeks because I was eight years old. So, of course, a week, <laughs> as you know, is about two years when you're... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I ab- absolutely loved that that song. And that's the first one that I can remember choosing to buy. And right. then it would have been somewhere along the line, I, it was two-tone. It would be about when I was about 10 years old. That was when that all started. And a uh, huge fan of, uh, and, and also, of course, Madness were linked to that. I know they weren't, but I think they, didn't they have one single on the two tone later. Yeah, first yes, single. Was on first one, Madness, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the Prince. The Prince, the Buster, Prince, was, yeah, Prince. And the whatever Prince. was on Did the you, other I mean, was there a Hamburg hat involved? Did you get a, a pork pie hat, rather? Did you get any of the, uh, any of the gear? Well, you know the way it is. You you pick something that's in your mum and dad's cupboard that you think looks like it. It doesn't. So it yeah, yes. some, some weird fedora that your mum had from somewhere to look, you know, at a, at a, a, a the seventies drinks party. Look, <laughs> probably got a feather in it. I can get to looking like Chaz Smash dressed yeah. in a fedora. So I I probably look more like Truman Capote. <laughs> so just hold up that cover again, Robin. That one that you just had, the uh, the beat that's, or whatever it was. And I do you, re- you of course remember the name of the figure which, who is pictured on the on the front of that 
that cover. No. Do we all... Oh, yeah. You Wolf, do. Oh, Wolf come Jabsco, Wolf wasn't it? Jabsco. Yes. Yeah, God, was, knows, they... God knows why. Somebody must have invented that name. Yeah. Walt Jabsco. That yes. Fantastic. Uh, presumably somebody still owns Walt Jabsco and is knocking out skinny ties with the picture on it uh, on them to this day, one would imagine. Were you a smash hit so reader? Did. No, never did smash hits. A- any I, music I, press? I, uh, I, once, uh, it, it used to be, depending on how much pocket money I had or how many times I'd washed a car or whatever it would be, it would be NME on a Wednesday. Then if I'd found another way of making s- probably... S- 50 pence it would have been then um then it would have been melody maker and then it would have been sounds on a friday if i found another way of somehow making another 50 pence so, so I've, you'd I've buy three back. sometimes wow oh, which yeah, did you prefer those, those fr- oh there we go there, there, there's the fantastic uh the ghost town uh single with that oh right yes. it is an amazing yes. cover really isn't it it's phenomenally uncommercial cover for a record that got to number one <laughs> Well, I think that's the whole thing about that record. Is I mean, I I think Ghost Town is still one of the greatest singles ever. I think mm. it's a remarkable piece of work. I think the way it transitions from those, you know, from that doom to suddenly Terry Hall. Yeah. With, uh, it, it, it's and there's so much going on in it. And when you're a kid, you you know that bit where some, it's it's like it's like when you you first hear something on a really good sound system and you suddenly realize that you only ever heard half the song when you loved it and now there's a whole other half of the song to love as well and um and i still i, I remember seeing J- uh, jerry dammer's um his kind of i can't remember what it's called now it's, it's basically it's kind of like sun ra orchestra that he has you know he yes has i saw that yeah and it is great because musically it is just perfection, and yet organisationally, it's still you know right. The next singer is going to co- oh no, he's not here. Uh, the, <laughs> and that's what I love is I love the fact that once it gets to the art of it, it's perfection. So detailed. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> he used to agonise over those records when he wouldn't leave the studio. They could, just couldn't get them. the last album took ages to make. They couldn't prize them out of the place. So well, hold up that co- hold up that cover again, Robin. That that uh, that ghost town because you know that's how you sold records to the kids in those days. I've just got this. This is this is the police can't stand can't stand losing you. And the hilarious way of packaging it was let's have Sting pretending to commit suicide on the outside. He's on nobody an said, ice cube with a with a with on a, with an a, ice cube with a no, one bar said, electric oh, heater on it. You can't possibly put that out in Woolworths. <laughs> there were all kinds of things phenomenal. Going. That's fantastic. So that ice cube is very similar to one one of the acts that Stuart Lee always loves talking about in the early days of alternative uh, kind of, you know, variety, whatever you want to call it, was the ice man whose whole act was standing on a block of ice and attempting to melt it over a period of 20 minutes with hair drives and things like that. And sometimes he would succeed and sometimes he didn't. And I'd never realised it was actually a, a, a police tribute act from someone who couldn't play any instrument. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's highly impressive. Absolutely, absolutely. So, sorry. Well, what what's, what else have you got there, Robin? Oh, well, I, I just just could mention the music press. I've got a few of the you know right. the, the the singles that would come with uh with the music right. press. I've got somewhere here. Which did you prefer out of the enemy sounds and the melody maker then? Melody Maker, I used to love the one of my favourite things later on in Melody Maker when I was about 17 was Nod's Corner, which was a little comedy column about what the drummer of the Fields of the Nephilim was thinking about that. (laughs) (laughs) Used to and and one of my one of the things that I have particular fondness for Fields of the Nephilim was when I went to university. There, there was a summer ball, you know, and, and the summer ball was always meant to be uh, really upbeat bands or bands. Yeah. I mean, in fact, I remember when I was actually working as a, you know, doing kind of tech work and stuff one year, we had, um, ah, what are they called? Uh, uh, the, the, oh, man, one of the great glam bands, The Sweep. We had The Sweep. Oh, right, yeah. Um, and poor uh, Brian Connolly was, um, I think he just, because he'd been very ill. Do you remember he'd been, been he, yeah, no, sure. he, he had something like, like 36 heart attacks in, in 12 minutes or whatever. And, they, and, uh, and it was just really interesting because he came along and he was in tight leather trousers, but they were so tight, he couldn't quite get his legs to angle to go up the steps. So we had to lift <laughs> him up. Like lift him like a standing figure, a solid, solid, and just place him on the stage, and then the lights would go up. So no, and then he would wiggle forward in these very, very, you know, these these, these hermetically sealed trousers, um, and they were great. They the first three songs they did at a speed in which people would recognise, and then they just got faster and faster and faster, 
until it made no sense. But but the reason I mention that is the year before, the big fun band were Fields of the Nephilim, obviously from an entertainment officer yeah. who had really got annoyed with all of the students and their taste in music. So, and, oh, you want fun for your summer ball? Well, I think you'll have Fields of the Nephilim then, which I think was just a fantastic booking. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's the most spinal tap moment, isn't it? The idea, I can't get that out of my head. Brian can't be carried up onto the stage because his trousers were too tight. But it was great because he went, to, it was just this solid, you know, it's perfectly vertical movement of like, you know, I think they're about, I, I think as usual with me, I managed to get, oh, I won't actually do the lifting. I'll do the directing of getting yes. on stage. And, right. and, yeah, to uh, me, to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then That's my incredible. mates, Nick and Tim, were kind of like had a leg each. Yeah, it was. That's sensational. So what about your, your radio obsession? Because you, you, you were talking about being obsessed with Peel, which you were, weren't you, I think? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely. And, and I loved, um, I mean, I loved all the documentaries he did as well. And, and there was a kind of relief as well is, is uh, where one of the things was I, I, I went to a public school, which I absolutely hated. And, and I think has probably politically been a huge influence on me seeing these people close up. And the one thing, and I remember just spending my whole time there. I was only there for five, you know, for five years. I, I, I didn't start in that kind of system, but I went into that system. And um, and I just remember thinking, oh, not only am I hating all of this, but once I leave, then I carry with me this horrible kind of nasty, you know. The, uh, so, and then I remember listening to a documentary that must have been done for Peel's 20th and it would have been mid-80s, and finding out that Peel had gone through that at Shrewsbury School, I think it was. Yeah, he was, um, that's right. It was like this relief to go that you didn't necessarily have to carry this, uh, you know, uh, economic financial mark of Cain. I mean, a very useful mark of Cain if you want to go into hedge fund management or whatever, but that was never my aspiration. And um, and so that also was some an additional thing. that Wow, here's someone who's really brilliant actually did, you know, had to go through this silly system as well of, uh, of, of ridiculous privilege. So you, you're a late night radio listener. Were you, were you the kind of person who noted down everything you played? I know, I know a lot of people did that. You, know, you didn't keep scrapbooks or anything like that, no. I've got, I have got somewhere lots of the little scraps of things that I cut out from the enemy and the melody maker and, 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 and sounds with little, and they're always just tiny little details of singles that you can barely kind of read. And yeah. uh, so, but I was never, I would just listen and, and be astonished. That was the thing is there's that amazing moment where I was thinking when I was looking through the, I've only got a few records left uh, of that I owned as a, as a, uh, as a child and as a young person because of a, a, an accident involving some sewage. Um, but <laughs> Which you must tell us about in detail yeah, in a moment. We, we will, yeah, I will cannot it, wait. It's um it's that interesting bit where there's a point where your musical taste. I mean, I look back. I remember loving uh, Hollywood Beyond. What's the color of money? What's the color of money? You don't need that. It's green or blue when you know it's red. Boom boom. Whatever that was. And and you know, there's a point where you like everything because it's just music, and it's before you start to go. Oh, hang on a minute. There's other there's other weirder things out there and you know there's that point where you go from taping on a c90 the top 30 you know i, I remember doing all of those cliched things you know oh brilliant they're playing the wicker rap i love the wicker rap you know a, a song which has not necessarily aged well obviously a, a, a rap with a man doing an impersonation oh, it's the alan wicker impersonation isn't it god i remember that yes <laughs> how did it go can you remember uh, uh, the Wicked Rap, where good is bad and bad is about as good as you can possibly get. Uh, <laughs> and then it's something about the uh, get down, get down and get funky. But it was just this, you know, that novelty. I remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I, I still have a real fondness for the preposterousness of, you know, because that wasn't that far off from then something like Laurie Anderson's Oh Superman becoming a, you know, a number two hit in the UK. And you, ha you have this very strange Catholic taste where you, you have that, that fascism of, hang on a minute, this isn't cool, hasn't come in yet. And so you just like, like somewhere here, I've got a picture disc. I'm still a huge fan of Cindy Lauper. Um, I think Cindy Lauper. Oh, nothing, yeah, nothing yeah, wrong with yeah. Cindy Lauper. Nothing wrong with Cindy Lauper. And, and, you know, I think there was probably an age when I would have felt a bit embarrassed about saying that. But I've got, yeah, somewhere here, there's a picture disc of Change of Heart, which was not her. Uh, 
I heard a lovely st- Sorry, I'm just waffling on now. This is the problem is because it's early in the morning that we're recording this. I don't normally. Oh, this is sorry. Just show you a record. This was one my sisters had and I never liked the song. But what a label. This is Rod Stewart's Hot Legs on the Reva label. Oh, yeah. Oh, the Reva label. Yes. Wow, yes. Yeah. Billy that Gaff's is... label. And John, then... John Cougar was on that label. That's uh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember. But that that yeah, is... Right. So I never listened to Hot Legs, but I would look at that label of what appears to be a, a, a lion vomiting tartan, and I'd be like, <laughs> wow, that's great. <laughs> See, nobody cares about labels now that you can no longer see labels go round. The whole thing about labels was whenever you watch, listen to a record, you watch the label going round. Yeah, the so Vertigo kind of label. Fantastic. Yeah, or anything. Yeah. But that's such a good point about the 80s, you know, that just people were so broad-minded, weren't they? The variety of stuff that got in the charts. And uh, as you say, the novelty acts, you know, those American pop acts, just uh, absolutely everything. You never knew what was going to be in the top 10 each week. And it was, oh, here's the uh, picture disc of, uh, again, bought from Record House in Amersham on the Hill. Picture disc of Cindy Lauper. There we are. Oh, oh right. right. Change of heart. Is, and I, I think the, the, the pity about Cindy Lauper is her production is so incredibly 80s <laughs> that it hasn't worn well. But the songs themselves, I, really I think, are fantastic and, 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 and beautiful and... Uh, you know, time after time, which then got used in in Strictly Ballroom, which is one of my favorite yeah. things of all time, is a, a cover version of that, a very nice cover version of that, and and True Colors and things like that. I've always had, uh, and and also drove all night. You know, I could happily just listen for about an hour, going back and forth between Roy Orbison's version and Cindy Lauper's, and back and forth and back and forth. That is a just wonderful, wonderful. Didn't you love um, Cindy Lauper's uh, appearance on USA for Af- Africa's uh, single, where she each of them are given about four seconds to make their point, and she throws herself into it, manages to get more notes and more volume than anybody else. It's absolutely <laughs> it steals the show. It's ma- it's magnificent. I, so, tell you, us about. Tell, go, on, sorry, go on, carry on. No, carry no, no, on. you go on. Well, I was going to say, tell us about the sewage. Oh, yeah. Well, so basically what happened was I'd gone up to Edinburgh to do a show that ended up being something of a disaster. And just before the first day of my show, uh, my wife rang me up and said, I've just got home. Uh, The house is uh, flooded with shit. And I lived in a basement flat. And uh, it was we basically got about one metre high uh, flooded, uh, the, the just sluice. Of oh. sewage. And the, the water company said it wasn't sewage. I remember having a conversation with them uh, and they said it's rainwater. And I said, you would really notice if that came, if that landed on you when it was raining. And I pointed to the various turds and said, if you had an umbrella out and at the end of go, oh, it's been very rainy today. My umbrella's covered in other people's turds. Then, you know, that that's, uh, and we ended, and so it was, and Every record, so it was about, it was just, I mean, nothing like what you've got, but it, 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 it was over a thousand albums. Um, and then I don't know how many seven inches, which were just. Oh, that must uh, have been heartbreaking. It was a really, it, it's very odd because I remember someone saying to me, couldn't you clean them all? And I said, but the problem with sewage is they kind of just looked wrinkled initially. But also then slowly all the details disappeared. And and I said, in, in the end, I would have to have, I mean, we mentioned you, Bet before, the ability to rub my hand gently over grooves and go, oh, yeah, I know what this is. This is Leggy Mambo <laughs> by Cud. You know, I would have to be able to do that. So it was... Um, and then it was it was very weird because I also had this disastrous... Well, it's, it's weird. The show I did in Edinburgh... In one way, it was a disaster. In another way, it's the reason that I do everything that I do now, the reason that I do Infinite Monkey Cage, all of the, all of the projects. That It's one of those things where when you're in the middle of failure and quite near kind of... I mean, I, I remember that year in Edinburgh. The combination... And I had to... I was doing a show on Radio 2, which I hated as well. So I would get up at four in the morning. I would fly down to London. I would record a show that I did not enjoy doing. I would then return to the flat to have a look at the state of it, look at some more bits of shit and some more beautiful things that have been destroyed. I would then fly back to do a show in which an audience would sit and go, I have no idea what this is. What is he talking about? And I ended up finding... I couldn't talk unless I was on stage. So if someone said, do you want to go for a drink? I would stand there for a moment and then go, I... And I'd have to, and it was like, I really, I had that proper kind of thing where you go, oh, I appear to be the cliche now of weeping in uh, the churchyard where Greyfriars Bobby is sat, you know, <laughs> looking over the grave. Um, 
<laughs> but all of those things, all, all of the shit and and the show that didn't really work and all of that kind of stuff were were at the same time the propellant for me working out what I wanted to do. But it was it is weird where every now and again I go, oh, I've got that. Re- oh, no, I haven't. Got oh, that. no. I haven't. Yeah. Oh, dear. Some of them, it's not so bad. Like I was annoyed at losing all of my Smith's 12 inches. I had every single 12 inch of the Smith's. No, it's not so bad. No, oh, you, know you know, Mark Morris has made a few turns. I mean, it might turn out we were facilitating him for a long time. If you're back to some of the interviews. Um, but yeah, has your affection for the Smiths been been altered by his recent uh, pronouncements? Or uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm one of those people who can't separate the artist from the human being. I, I especially if it's things like that. I still love Johnny Marr. Um, how must Johnny Marr feel about the idea that the reputation of this group is being, being diminished, isn't it, on a he's, daily basis? He's, he's a very witty man, isn't he? So, I mean, and yeah. he's got such a. It was a. I remember watching him. It was. It must have been the John Peel stage, I think, at, uh, at Glastonbury a few years ago, and he just walked on, rose between his teeth, threw it out to the audience, and I think probably started with big mouth strikes again. So people are. Uh, which is one of the most in, 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 I, I, I love that song and it always reminds me of seeing you caught dancing on the old grey whistle test which is still one of my favourite things of uh, was Who, you, me? Was it you Mark or was I, it uh, Andy K- Kershaw? No I think it might have been me was I it, think it was you as far as I remember the camera comes back very quickly and you're halfway in yes. doing a, the dance of Morrissey um, I was <laughs> Absolutely was. lovely moment, and and then you immediately sit down. Oh, hello, welcome back. Um, it's magnificent, <laughs> and and worth celebrating every year on the day that that happened. We should all celebrate that. <laughs> oh lord! <laughs> but he just had so much charisma, and it was such a joy. And and so I I still think the Smiths are a great band. You cannot take that away, and you cannot take away the fact that Morrissey was a a, a, a brilliant lyricist. And when he did steal, he stole perfectly from people like Elizabeth Smart, you know, which is the uh, uh, at Grand Central Station. I, I I sat down and wept, you know, which is a, is a magnificent novella. Um, but there's just a point where you go, oh, you've become that. You've become, I mean, the idea that there's been any transition from Morrissey going, well, I think you'll find the real victim is me. And of course, we've always known that's the, the way that he was. But yeah. now because you also have people like Trump and you have Lawrence Fox and you have all these other people who, whatever the level of privilege is, I think you'll find I'm the one suffering. You know, that 30 years now of reading those awful columns where people go, well, of course, the worst thing to be now is a white middle class man. And that's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've checked the yeah. statistics. It's not. Um, and and so I, I, I don't really listen. I, I can still listen to Hatful of Hollow, actually, uh, every now and again. But also, it's not like I didn't already listen to it a lot. It, it's one of those things where I don't like the idea of being trapped too much in the past. And so it's not as if I go, oh, I can never listen to the Smiths again. I go, to be honest, I've probably over-listened for about 20 years. I should right. have probably been moving on. <laughs> so there's so many great bands out there and so many interesting bands. And, you know, whenever I listen to things like Late Junction on Radio 3, and, and they're just and that's where I still keep those notes. You know, Late Junction on Radio 3, these brilliant, still one of my favourite things. Of, there, there was a the, uh, magnificent um, interview with Robert Wyatt. Did you hear that Robert Wyatt one? On no, there? no, go on. I love Robert oh, Wyatt. It was so, there was one of my favourite stories. There were lots of brilliant stories on it. But one of them was about why he moved out of London, where he said, yeah, I used to have uh, Brian Eno coming round and, um, you know, we just kind of noodle around with stuff. But uh, the neighbours were always complaining about the noise. And I just thought the idea of the neighbours, shut that ambience up, you know, (laughs) a, a beautiful thing. But uh, yeah, so 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 I, I am d- detached from some. I mean, I've I've still got it. I've I've got the Morrissey being Terence Stamp uh, cover. Yeah, oh, right, yeah. right. <laughs> um, Did you ever? Were you ever in the band yourself? I uh, there's a some friends. Uh, the the Reg Gutteridge experience was the name. Uh, after obviously the Reg, Reg Gutteridge, the uh, um, uh, boxing commentator, oh, um, right. used to play. Um, oh my God, I've forgotten. Uh, opposite the Rainbow, um, knocked down years ago now. Oh, they George Roby. Yeah, the Roby. We that used part, to play the Roby yeah. once a yeah. month. I was rubbish. Uh, Were I you the lead mid- vocalist? Yep. And, and can you remember any song titles? Yeah, uh, the Hornsy Axe Murderer, based on Dennis Nielsen. <laughs> uh, though, um, <laughs> Factually, Gradually, foot tapping stuff. 
Yeah. Oh no, it was. It was there's a man who lives down at the end of my street. He is not the kind of bloke that you'd like to me. He he looks quite normal. He lives a normal life, but hides behind his normal back a sharp and bloody knife. He's the horn he axe. <laughs> Murder. Oh ho, oh, he's the horn he axe. He cuts you up into little bits and puts you into plastic bags. Then he flushes you down the toilet until the drain smell so bad. That was it, basically. Um I love the way you can still remember the entire thing. You probably did the whole set for it. It, it was well, we also the, the covers were good. We did a cover from uh, Adam Ant, uh, his his first album. So before he was Adam and the Ants, uh, from Dirt Wears White Dirt Socks. Wears White Socks. Good record. It is, and we we did Never Trust a Man with Egg on His Face. Yeah, do you remember that one? I do. I do. Man, yeah, there was uh, they, they down kind of... the street with a son and a daughter. Oh, they look so sweet. Their mummy turned to daddy and she said, my dear, you better write a will because the end is near. Then I pulled out a pistol, saw the sparks, messed up the suit that he bought from Marks because he'd heard the voices from outer space. It was great. <laughs> That's absolutely astonishing that you can remember all these lyrics. Uh, <laughs> just, just phenomenal. An absolute waste. You think of what Brian Cox has kept in his mind in terms of understanding the nature of the universe and the ephemera. If you could uh, only delete universe. all those yeah, files. files. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so what was, the first, what was the first time you went on stage not singing? Oh, that I was about, I was 18 years old uh, in terms of first stand-up gig. And it was for a friend of my sister's birthday party. And I have no idea why anyone would have listened or why. It's really weird. Everyone was very nice. Um, I have no Freedom. real memory of it. I've kind of erased the most of the gig. And then about a year later, I Arthur Smith got me. I, I met Arthur Smith. Uh, there was a, a, a conversation about the, um, d- the play Comedians. Um, and he said, oh, I can get you a gig. And I did this terrible gig in South End. I was useless, absolutely useless. And then I just kind of kept going, despite all the warnings that were clearly saying there's probably other choices in your life, which would be... Uh... Well, what was it about it that made it attractive, then, that made you want to go back and do it? Because everybody talks about how terrifying those first gigs are, yet there's something that compels them to, to get over that. And there's something it's an that obsession, obviously... though. It is, I mean, I do think it's kind of... Um, that there are, I think comedy is much bigger now, so it doesn't have as many people who are ill enough to just keep doing it. I think when I started, that was that's that there's nothing. I mean, you know, when I do, and I'm I'm incredible in terms of my uh, self disdain. I have, you know, I still don't even ca- even saying comedy. If someone says what do you do, I feel embarrassed because I think someone will go, well, I saw you, and you, you weren't very funny. And I think I've been doing this 30 years. It's how I've made my living for 30 years. But I do not, if I'm doing a benefit gig and I'm backstage, I'm like, oh, my God, all these people are real comedians. And I'm on. Yeah. What am I going to do? Even little gigs where someone will say, can you come along and do, and, and do a set? And I think, oh, God, but the other ones will know how to do comedy. And it's a very weird relationship. But it also, I mean, I, I did, I've not done many gigs, obviously, in the last 16 months. But I did, I did a two-hour solo show in Bath the other day. And it is a lot of it is kind of just a uh, stream of consciousness. And the worst thing is that when I do it, it is when I go, oh, yeah, this is the bit where I'm happiest in my life. It's just everything else that is difficult. Uh, it's all the other voices that are hard. And so I, I, I do think there's a, a, a kind of, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I wrote a book that was partly kind of around this book, Well, I'm a Joke and So Are You. But looking back now, there's a lot of things that I should have covered that I didn't cover. But it's... Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I think the people that I know who are comics, there is no other choice. They have yeah. to do it. All of my friends uh, would not stop if the, you know, the money has never been the reason that, it, you know, obviously that helps and it might be why you keep going, but they would still have a need to do that. You know, whether it's friends like Josie or Stuart Lee or any of those people, I think the necessity of going out there. And, and I'm, in fact, I was thinking about it this morning, just having a little uh, Ricky Grover, comedian Ricky Grover, we were just DMing each other. And I, was, I suddenly thought about one of the reasons people go, why is it in the UK that comedy is a big thing, stand-up comedy, and, and in the US as well? And I think it is because the more repressed a culture is, the more stand-up will thrive because you have that period of time on stage where you can just let everything out and the audience sometimes will go. I mean, I've always found if I've done things about mental health, then the number of people who come up to me afterwards and say, oh, God, I thought I was the only one. And, 
you suddenly re- I mean, I realized that after I did a tour about was it three years ago, the book came out, something like that. And it was my realization of how many people leave their house. And as they go out the door, they go, right. Okay. Let's put the, the shell on now and I'll be able to get through the day. And I suddenly realized how many people are doing that. Um, Sorry, I've got very sounds very. No, serious. but it must have been <laughs> even worse than uh, for comedians than it, than it has been for musicians the last eighteen months. The, the, you know, not being able to get out there and deal with a live audience. Hence the number of you know Zoom based shows. Pod- I mean, that's why we. <laughs> I know. I just the Therapy. moment it started. I went, right, Josie, let's do, uh, and with my mate Trent, who does all the brilliant producing for the shows that we do, I, I went, right, let's do a morning show. Let's do a show every morning at 10 o'clock, and I'll, I will ring up everyone that we know, and we'll see who's on. And, of course, everyone was immediately like, you know, there was the Mark Gates and Joe Brand, all these people, and, and, and Miles Hunt and stuff like, yeah, yeah, want to do a gig, want to do a gig, don't matter if it's online. And we did yeah, two yeah, months yeah. of every single, yeah. and it meant that we, it was only a little bit later that year that I suddenly started to go, oh, shit, this is really weird. And this is because by immediately descending into some form of busyness uh i could the the modicum of sanity which i keep in my back pocket was kind of intact for that time yeah yeah so you you but the, your gig the other night in bath i think i think you said it was in bath mm. i mean presumably just the sound of people's laughter must be immensely healing you know which is something you don't get in this form isn't yeah it? well that that is i've not realized until I went back to gigs, how much was missing? It's a weird thing that I think, like I said, that first two months, I kind of covered it up. And then it was only the first time back on stage where you realise, also your brain does not, you cannot do a Zoom gig with the brain that you have for a live gig. I mean, I still find that uh, how many Zoom things you do or whatever online things, there's a bit where you can't find the word that you want and there's all, you know, all of that normal scrabbling around of everyday life. And then the first gig I did back was up at the uh, um, up in in in, in Walthamstow, uh, and um, and I, I went, oh, everything comes, yeah. The brain just goes right. I can show off for fifty minutes now. Don't worry. Uh, you need that word. But There's also, something. doing comedy on Zoom, it must be very hard to tell whether things are working or not. If you're in front of a live audience, you get the immediate sensation from their response as to whether or not the avenue you're pursuing is entertaining. And if it isn't, you can you can. You can change it, but if you're if you're just doing it on Zoom, it must be it must be very hard to work that out. I should spend more time thinking about whether it's entertaining. Anyway, I think you're right. <laughs> the, uh, but I do. No, I, I mean, I, I think one of the advantages I have is I, as you know from just doing this with me now, that is I just talk. There's no, you know, especially when I've not been on stage for a while, and I've got. Uh, like the, I'm, I'm working on a new show, which I'm going to call A Billion Thoughts. I was reading a thing. Frank Wilczek, the, the the scientist, said he reckoned that we have roughly a billion thoughts in our life that if you look at the size of a thought and you look how long a life is and I thought I'll just do a show with, and I've got like so far I've got uh 86 pages of notes and on each page it's just one sentence for each idea so so there's about 30 ideas on each page and there's yeah. 86 pages of that and I just go out and I just start and and I think there's a relief in some of the audience that they don't feel they have to perform that much in terms of going oh he's definitely delivered a punchline because ah, they just right. go was that one yes. oh, was that, maybe that was one <laughs> oh, you're yeah. doing a funny voice now what's going on and, and so i think that that it, and and that's what i've enjoyed with the zoom gigs i don't i just look directly down into in, into the camera and i just start and i just see where and i try as much as possible to replicate the stream of consciousness and the kind of tangents just get the energy up so I get, at the end of it I can have that. It's like, you know, I love the thing sometimes when you do a gig and someone goes, oh, I really like that bit you did about the Dachshund in the kimono. And you go, what? That wasn't me. And they go, was? I said, I don't think I did a bit about a Dachshund in a kimono. And they go, yeah, you did. And then slowly you work back and you go, then what's that bit? The Oh, it was me, yeah. And that is, I, I think that's part of the joy of performance, which is that's the level of escape it can be. You go into parts of your mind, you can't hear the negative voices as much. So they're always there. I mean, I can always see people in the front row going, this is the worst night of my life and I'm so <laughs> angry. And then you look down at the end and you see that they've been laughing. They've been laughing all along, but you've drawn, except once okay. in the past. Are you drawn to the people? Because they always say this, don't they? Don't look at the people who appear to be impassive. Look at the people who are responding favorably which do you do i am always drawn to that thing of i i I was doing a gig in trowbridge a few weeks back and i had that lovely and it's because it's socially distanced as well i mean a room that would normally have 200 but there's 32 i mean that's the great thing is a month before a gig people go great news you've sold out 
all 32 tickets have gone. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and, and I looked and there was a table uh, of, of couples, kind of late middle age, and, and the, the, one of the men just did not look like he was enjoying himself. But of course, <laughs> I'm always drawn, as I, I ended up talking about Reginald Beckwith. Do you remember Reginald Beckwith? Oh, that's a name ring to Bell. No, go I on. don't go on. He's go one of, on. If you ever watch Talking Pictures TV... Yes. He is one of those people that will pop up and you go, oh, bloody hell, what's his name? He's I in everything. Robert yes. Donat the other day. Yeah. He, oh, bloody <laughs> hell, what's his name? And Reginald Beckwith is one of those people who appears to have just, he was always at Elstree and Ealing, and people who go, yeah. Reg, can you come and play a reporter <laughs> today? <laughs> no, that's unavailable. Just um, put on this Macintosh and yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, I brought be fine. my own hat. It's a fedora. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's, <laughs> that's fine. Madness. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, but I ended up going down all of these weird tangents and, it's nice to be able to turn to have that moment where you go, and it's fantastic. All of it, except you, there's always someone who is going to be there and go, I have no idea why we keep. I mean, it's a bit, it reminds me of those lovely stories of I went to see Stuart Lee shortly before the lockdown. He's playing Watford Coliseum. And there's the beautiful thing where the whole audience are laughing uproariously, but you will always find little patches of people going, Well, I do not get this at all. I do not get it. And that makes it so much more, you know, and he says at the merch stall, he'll hear people walking past. He always does his own merchandise right at the end. He runs off to do that. And just, just going, Mike, we're not going again. Never again. It's the fourth time. I don't like it. I don't like it. And <laughs> that's, so, but, but more often than not, because I'm so niche and the kind of audience I is, I'll find out that the grumpy looking man has had a lovely time and he'll send me a message. Yes. So I had a lovely time. I've just got one of those faces. The faces. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. So it doesn't destabilize you because people get obsessed by it, don't they? Just I, I don't think I can be more. I've got to work on this, got to win this Mark. person over. <laughs> Yeah. I think that's the thing is that I'm, I'm, I mean, I always have in my head perpetual, I, I've realised, I don't know if it's got worse, the, the more I've done it, is uh, there's always anxiety in, in the shows. There's always a fear that people are not having a nice time. It's one of the things that drives me is that I always want to feel that people have had a really good time. And But I, at the same time, I also realise that, you know, my subject matter in one way is broad, but it's not kind of, you know, uh, the mainstream what what might be seen as very main, main, mainstream stuff um but it's it's always in my mind the, the the speed of it and all of the different ideas partly come from i think the idea of going i hope you like this one this should be yeah yeah oh, oh good you're yeah. happy you're happy and then <laughs> once eight seconds have gone of silence uh i'll start to think oh god oh my god i've lost them i think it's only eight so you're allowed to you're doing two hours and, and <laughs> the other side of me knows i think one of the things that i've learned over time is People can really be enjoying themselves if you're off doing weird tangents about stuff and they're enjoying the ride. And I think that's right. the one I think stand up can sometimes get so bogged down by the fact that you need to keep delivering what is definitely comedy. And here's the punchline and not yep. realize that. I, I mean, I remember watching various acts when I started and sometimes there'd be an act had gag after gag after gag after gag and all big laughs. And then there was someone else who would have these wonderful meanderings and strangeness about them and sometimes silence. And then you'd sit in the bar afterwards and it was the meanderer, the person with the silences that everyone was talking about. And everyone had forgotten the joke man because he had just yeah. been a machine of doing yeah. it. And at no point had there been a, a connection or... Because or, or... he had a drama and a tension, presumably, that you kept you Yeah, involved. and I think also people lent... It's like that bit where when you start dying on stage, sometimes you speed up and you say more things. And one of my favourite people to watch dying on stage is a very funny comedian called Paul Foote, who uh, was on Buzzcocks and Noel Fielding, directed one of his shows and stuff. And, and Paul won two out of three of the Edinburgh New Act competitions one year and was immediately elevated. He had a brilliant 10 minutes, but he didn't have half an hour. Also, he had a wonderful quirkiness about him, which some people, some of the more, well, the men who might presume they're alpha males would feel alienated by the way that he would deliver his... his uh, and, you would, and he learned how to die with such a plumb that it, you almost, as an act, though you didn't want him to die, you also did, you think, I hope it goes well for Paul, but if it doesn't, we will all be watching. Because he would get slower and stranger. And, and people would, you know, those who were, I mean, I remember someone, I can't remember who said, I remember doing a tour, and then I, after the tour, I went straight back into some club gigs. And of course, there's such a difference between people coming to watch you for two hours and people just coming to see a bunch of comics, and you're just one of those bunch of comics. And 
people haven't come to see you. They've come for a night out. And I remember doing this gig. It was actually at Heaven, the night nightclub there. Um, and uh, walking on and thinking, oh, this can be a tough gig. And then starting to think, hang on a minute. I have got some old mainstream ideas that I could use. But what if seven people out of the 200 here have come because they saw me on the bill and then I do something which isn't me at all? It's comedy, but it's not my comedy. It's just some comedy I wrote. And I just dug my heels and I went, no, do what you do. Do what you like yeah. doing. Yeah. And by the end of it, there was still one really furious table. And I was glad they were furious because <laughs> I didn't think I'd like them anyway. I think there's, you know, I, I do think sometimes there's different, some com comedians are beloved entertainers. You've got to make them all laugh. And then there's that other thing, which going, you look at sometimes people who despise you and you go, we don't want to spend any time with them. Are they in any way the people that I, you know, I, I know some people who go, oh, brilliant. I didn't entertain them. I've made their night worse. <laughs> so who's the, like who the comedian who had the most, the biggest impression on you when you, you know, when you were getting interested in comedy? Who was the most? Who influenced you the most? It's so easy. That is Rick Mail. It is. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Why? Is, because there was nothing like him for you know. I would have probably been ten or eleven years old when Kick Up the Eighties started, and he did Kevin Turvey. Kevin Turvey, was Kevin unbelievable. Turvey. Yeah. And I love I've, the love I have for those early years. Uh, it was, I mean, <laughs> I can remember, I can remember one when he's sick there and there's a door, the doorbell and said, uh, said, uh, uh, and his mum said, I tried someone on the phone for you. He said, who is it? The Dave Clark five. I can remember these <laughs> ridiculous things you just say. And getting his mother to drink sherry, I think, you know. Anyway, go yeah, on. I remember the one where he went to a park and drank a bottle of sherry. And then when he woke up, someone had been sick all over my face. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was just those um but it was really uh that uh, and, I, and i think for the whole of my generation that that rick mail was i mean it is it is the sex pistols at the hundred club for those yeah, of us yeah. who two yes years. We, like rick mail seeing him for, and, and alexi as well you know was really important yeah listening to the the cac album as well but but it just changed everything I, I remember shortly after he died i did a show called the alternative comedy memorial society which is this wonderful night uh done by a guy john luke roberts and tom tuck where yeah. people just do any experimentation they want and at the end of it it's always uh, the audience have to go a failure a noble failure. Uh, and I remember one night walking out in Edinburgh, it's like like the, the, the sixth gig of the day. And I was like, oh, fuck, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I haven't thought of anything. And then I thought, well, it's actually called the Alternative Comedy Memorial Society. So Rick Mail's recently died and I will do a thing just about Rick Mail. And I stood there and I did this very heartfelt thing about Rick Mail and about the fact, you know, the very reason that I'm, I'm here now is yeah. because of you, Rick Mail. You stupid fucking Bastard. I've been seeking the approbation of strangers for 30 years, coming up to the Edinburgh Festival every year, going, maybe they'll like me, maybe I'll get on telly, maybe I'll get on telly. And it's never fucking happened. Thank you very much, Rick Mel. You've ruined my life. I could have had a nice clerical job, something nice and simple without all of the mental health nightmares of standing up. Love me, love me, love me. I hate you, Rick Mail. And I thought it's kind of what he would have liked. It's what he would have wanted. <laughs> How did that go down? Oh, it was. I, I think that because I was, I was storming through this, the audience as well. I was running around, screaming yeah. in their faces. Yeah, uh, which is always a bit of a shock if people have only heard me on Radio Four. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's not what they expect. But look, we have you got any more records you want to show oh, us? I've and, got and loads. Tell I'm us, really sorry. Tell I'm us what is no, go on, show us. No, your this is Can fantastic. I just the listeners, it's, it's early in the morning and I've had loads of coffee, and I'm sorry I've, I've been talking too no, much. No, okay, this uh, is, is really interesting. But you've got to finish by telling us what is the greatest record ever made. Oh God, that's a see. This was I remember. This this is the the the, the double single version of "Beat Surrender" by the right. Gen. Yeah, which right. I just remember that that was kind of a. Uh, these were interesting. I remember the way that you get politicised sometimes by uh, music, which is um, I got. I remember a lot of the kind of Little Stevens' "Bitter Fruit," uh, oh, which was um, and Latin Quarter. Do you remember Latin Quarter? I remember, yeah, the, the name, yeah. And, and they, they did, all of their stuff was, a lot of their, their work was all about the apartheid in South Africa. And I think they did a song, they uh, might have done a song with Miriam McCabe as well. But let's, uh, this is one of my favourite covers. That's Elvis Costello. Uh, there. That's a fantastic uh, High Fidelity um, cover. Uh, let me just see what, I also, I had this thing with singles where I love theme tunes. And I was, and also, actually, I'll, I'll show you some of these things. This is my obsession with comedy. I would even, I'd just buy a single by Phil Cool because he was a comedian and he had a single out. 
and and this doesn't get played so much. It's it's him doing bridge over troubled water. <laughs> <laughs> As Rolf Harris. Wow. And, uh, the B we've, side is, we've not had that on before. <laughs> yeah. uh, have you had Mel Smith's Trembling before? Uh, the song I don't, believe, for, don't Mel, believe so. Which has on the B side Easy, which was uh, a song from this musical he did with Bob Goody and uh, Phil Davis and uh, Paul Bown uh, called The Gambler. Why Spies Like Us by Paul McCartney? Why would I have that? Just because it was a comedy film. And so I had to get that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, um, I'm just going to start rifle through the... Um, in one way, this is not the greatest single ever, but there is a moment where when you remember the first time you heard Losing My Religion before it became an anthem, yeah, it was something quite remarkable. It was something that was so unexpected at that time uh and that, that mandolin point. intro so unusual mandolin intro and yeah. a video based on tarkovsky's the sacrifice how much more can people bow down to the mainstream <laughs> um the uh i've got joe dolan here do you know joe dolan oh go irish guy obviously yeah 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 he, he did a great um album called joe's 90s which was him singing various indie hits from the 90s uh, oh, and but in a real crooner fashion. So he did like, you know, he did suede. Hi, 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 on gasoline, shaking their hips, the bits to the hips. So oh, the beautiful ones. That was great. Um, Daisy Chainsaw, Teenage Fan Club, Jar Wobble, Birdland. What <laughs> happened? What happened? I don't know what happened with Birdland. It's such a bizarre story. Do you know, David? Uh, no, no idea. Go on. No. No, they were going to be huge. They were, you know, they were all <laughs> over the music press. Um, and then... So what year was that, Birdland? It could have been about 1989 and 1990, I think. Yeah. And then I remember a big article in the NME that they'd signed to Sony in, in Japan or something, and, and it was... Oh, that's, but that's probably... That's the end of it, usually. This is, this is another kind of Roaring Boys story. It's the Roaring it? Boys. Yeah, oh, yeah, God, Tell me about the Roaring it, Boys. Well, well they the were signed as being uh, Duran Duran with Adam Ant as the lead singer, weren't they? They were the ultimate kind of uh, new age romantic... Um, there was something about the hand of Sony Records that could kill any yeah. career. Yeah, right at the, the yeah, outset. Yeah. You know, there's something about it. I don't know. Uh, they may oh, be victims to that. So you haven't got, have you gone? What is the greatest record ever made? Do you have well, one? I have to, right. I'll tell you what. I'll ju instead of that, I'll just tell you the two singles that I've listened to most. Now, now one right, of them, okay. actually, I'll tell you three. One is, I still think the opening of Making Plans for Nigel by XTC is, right. a, is an incredible, it's one of the great, first 10 seconds of any single. I remember I was given that by my friend Alex Thomas for probably my 10th birthday. He gave me that and Splodge Nessa Bounds, uh, Simon Temple. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually have, I've somewhere in the first time I went to an HMV sale, I bought the Splodge Nessa Bounds album for 25 pence. Also Rick Wakeman's <laughs> soundtrack for the burning for 50 pence, um, which is the best thing about that film. And, um, but Splodge Nessa Bounds, what people, they, they always think the single was two pints of lager and a packet of crisps, but that was the B side because the A side was two. Oh. Sexy. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Okay. Wow. God. The A side was called Simon Templar. Oh. And it was just Simon Templar, Simon Templar, Simon Templar, Simon, Simon Templar's really hunky, all his girls. And that, that was, and so it was the B side, two pints of lager. Um, but I would say that from Love Will Tear Us Apart by Joy Division, I think being, I would have been 10 when that came out, and that felt like it's a song that I can return to over and over again. Um, I've never got bored of it. Um, I know this greatest thing. I, I, it, it's, it's that thing. It's not necessarily about that because it's about what I'm connected to. So I, th I think that, and also the stranglers golden Brown. I still right. think one of terrific. The, uh, yeah. I was, so, I, I saw them at beautiful days two years ago. And uh, I also, I, I toured with them in, in Croatia once as well. But that's a different story. It was the same <laughs> year that I worked with Sue Pollard. Now, wouldn't it be amazing <laughs> if all these things were made up, but they're bloody true. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but I really, um, it was magnificent. It, it was, you know, obviously Dave, Dave was still in the band and JJ still in the band. And uh, the band were fantastic. And it was the beautiful days and it was pouring. It was absolutely pouring. But beautiful days is one of those kind of festivals where it's, it's real proper festival. It's old style festival goers and everyone's just having a great time and everyone's just drinking and just, um, and then when they played always the sun was when the water became, when it really started pouring. And the irony of that was delightful. 
And then they played so fast because they knew they had a shorter set than normal that they stopped for a bit and they went, oh, we just found out we've been playing so fast. We can fit another song in. We can fit two more songs in, it turns out. Yeah, we can fit two more songs in. And that was just a, a, a beautiful thing to watch. And I, and I still I have a real fondness for, for The Stranglers and for a lot of their singles as well. Well, that's the complete reverse of the Chuck Berry method, isn't it? You know, after, <laughs> after 45 minutes, you're off. <laughs> that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm leaving in the middle of a song. I've, I've, I've done my contractual obligation. I love the variety, Robin, of, of the stuff you've done. The idea that you go from splodgeness abounds B-sides to the majesty of Joy Division seconds later. Been a lot it's of fun. Such a great. I, I really think that 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 single was again. It's a, it's a really interesting time for me. That that transition between punk and new wave and all of these kind of you know women and men who you always you know that they whatever books they had in their pockets, the kind of the influence that they had from the reading list of of, of, of yeah, of absolutely Patti Smith or art college or whatever, all of that. And they and they and they would wear these influences. I mean, not not yeah. in a boring way on their sleeve. Yeah. You, you'd listen to a single, and then you would suddenly find. I mean, I'd never known that "Love Will Tear Us Apart" was basically a follow up to Captain and Tennille's "Love Will Keep Us Together." That was yes. what inspired it, wasn't it? That's right. Well, no, that it's, it's Neil. It's Neil Sedaka, isn't it? Because Neil Sedaka recorded uh, "Love Will Keep Us Together" at the same studio that they made "Love Will Tear Us Apart." Strawberry Brilliant. Studios in in uh, in um, where is it? It's some of them Manchester. Where it's is it? Manchester. It's, it's the ten CC studios. Isn't it? Yeah, I can't remember. Stockport. Stockport. There you go. Well, that's been fantastic, Robin. <laughs> that is, I'm you sorry, know, which I'm, I'm, I can't I'm, think we uh, there, there's nothing that we didn't cover. Oh, let me see. I, we didn't. We never yeah, covered. It's going to find some. Obviously, the green vinyl for L7's Everglade didn't get out there. Oh, God. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm trying to see what... Uh, uh, oh, Brass Neck there. Or Brass Neck. Uh, wedding present. Um, they're very high up in terms of uh, my favourite things. Oh, were you, a, were you a gadgetarian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and I still think they are... That Going Going album that they did about 2015, something like that, is a fantastic yeah. album. And an album which, for the first five songs you would have no idea that it was uh, a, a wedding present album. You know, I've always found it yeah. interesting, that stuff that he did, um, and, and also with, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the single, but I, Cinerama, you know, all, yeah. all that experience. And I always find it, and sometimes when I go and see them live, and I see an enormous number of men who look like me, um, oh, look, there's another bald man, <laughs> Poe going at his age. Um, and... Uh, I'm always amazed when people go, oh, I was a bit annoyed they didn't do Kennedy tonight. And I'm like, I'm fine. I don't need to hear Kennedy again. I can play that in my head. I want to this hear more it. of the new stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's a pity that we get, you know, I see this with a lot of bands where they, yeah, you know, obviously they go, it's like that odd thing where you suddenly end up with those, the road shows that used to have things like Rock Around the Clock and 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 50s bands and 60s. And now you see the indie road shows from the late 80s and early 90s. And you think, oh, this is just like when it was Freddie and the Dreamers. And well, uh, Alex, <laughs> Alex, Alex said, Magic Alex Gold, who's uh, producing and listening to this in the background, he plays he played in an, in an indie covers band for a wedding the other day, didn't he, Mark? Where he, yeah, they, didn't, that's what they wanted to hear. Yeah, white the whole stripes tent was full of people. Yeah, yeah. white stripes and uh, the killers and all that. That's what they. That's what they had to prepare. So that's the future. Indie wedding. Well, look, it's the future. <laughs> yes. Robin, lovely to talk to you. There's been a lot of fun. Sorry, that was all fantastic. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.